Before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Loretta Osteen. Loretta is a master gardener from the class of 2010, and her passion for plumeria began during a family vacation to Hawaii. She soon joined the Plumeria Society of America and began growing plumeria in her home landscape on Tiki Island. Her landscape quickly became crowded, but she was fortunate enough to own the lot next door and that filled up with plumeria as well. At one point in time, she had over 200 plumeria surrounding her home. Loretta, over to you. Thank you so much for uh, joining this and bear with me. It's my first time to do uh, a Zoom <laughs> presentation. Okay, uh, there will be some photos in, uh, in this presentation and they are all my photos. And um, these are some area that can be grown in Galveston County area. Um, so just, you know, I, I, I occasionally just put in photos, just kind of brighten things up and, and so that we can look at them and kind of go, ooh, ah, especially this year. <laughs> so, okay, what's in a name? Plumeria. Uh, Plumeria is named for the French botanist uh, Charles Plumier, I believe is how to pronounce that. Um, Plumeria are a member of the Apocanaceae family of plants. Uh, Plumeria is actually the scientific name. Frangipani uh, is derived from the French word for coagulated milk because when a branch or a leaf is broken, uh, the sap resembles milk. And that's a trait in the Apocanaceae family of plants. Uh, oleanders, adeniums, and vincas are all in this um, Apocanaceae family. Um, so sometimes you'll hear people refer to them as frangipani. So that's where that came from. Other names that people have heard of or use would be the layflower, because in Hawaii, um, it's, it's common to make the uh, Hawaiian lays out of myriad blossoms because they're so fragrant. Uh, temple tree, um, in certain cultures, they would plant these in their uh, churchyards or temples. Uh, Flor de Mayo, uh, because typically they start blooming in the month of May. Uh, Japoon, or uh, egg flower, because uh, one of the more common colors is, is a white with a yellow center. And when you cook an egg, when you crack it open, and it's white with a yellow center. Uh, another term would be a graveyard tree. Um, is, uh, in certain cultures, they would plant plumerias in cemeteries, graveyards, um, because of the cycle of they go dormant, they look dead, but in the spring, they come out with these gorgeous blooms. And so in certain cultures, people uh, really thought, had a strong connection with uh, the afterlife or, you know, like life after death. So if grandma was buried somewhere, you know, they would plant a plumeria. So certain, certain countries, uh, like in the Caribbean, you can find a, a plumeria planted in the cemeteries there. Uh, they are actually native to tropical America, uh, Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. They were introduced to Hawaii in 1860. Um, so many times we associate Plumeria with Hawaii um, because a lot of times that's where we first saw them or encountered them, but they're actually native to, uh, to like just, just south of us here. Mexico. Okay, and here's some more uh, photos, pictures of blooms. This was an exhibit at Corpus Christi, the Museum of Science and History. Um, I uh, thought this was interesting. It's a, it was a permanent exhibit, so the actual tree is is you know one of those like uh, artificial trees. But here's your example, you know, it says frangipani and then underneath the um, 
plumeria, uh, and it says known by many common names in Mexico, including Flor de Mayo. Um, and and it was deliberately planted since ancient times because of its wonderful scent. So I just, I thought that was fascinating. Um, I, I happened to be in Corpus Christi um, visiting my daughter when uh, she was an officer in the Navy for 10 years and for a while was stationed in Corpus Christi. And uh, one weekend I went down there to spend a couple of days when she had some time off and we went to this museum and actually she spotted this exhibit. She spotted it before I did. She was like, mom, look, Plumeria. Okay, moving on here, uh, flower shape. This particular flower is uh, candy stripe, and sometimes you'll get blooms that have more than five petals. The most common enumeration uh, uh, of, the, of the bloom petals is five, but every now and then you'll get six, maybe seven, and that's just kind of interesting. You sort of do it, you sort of do a double take. Um, candy stripe is very pretty. It's just kind of a rainbow color. Okay, here's there's a variety of shape and color. Bally Whirl is one with a double bloom, and it has 10 petals. Uh, it's the only one that I'm familiar with that has 10 petals. And um, uh, Charlotte Ebert is, is very large. If you ever see this, um, the blooms are about five inches in diameter. So it's, and I'm just showing these as examples of different shapes and colors. Here's one called Crown Jewel. And at the tip of the petals, it, it kind of twists like this. It's kind of, it's just unique, different. Uh, this is one that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So just, just putting that in there. It's just fun when you see these every now and then. Okay, Plumeria love sun. The more sun, the better. They bloom best with full sun um, or at least a half a day of sun. And this is Aztec gold. And I just, that when I see this picture, I just think of sunshine because of the beautiful yellow colors. <clears throat> Okay, um, on the water requirements, good drainage is essential. Uh, they don't like wet feet. They can tolerate neglect. They can tolerate some drought uh, uh, better, than, better than most plants. Uh, the main thing is just uh, they, they don't like to be planted in, in where it stays wet. Um, feeding your plumeria is going to be essential to uh, bloom production. They're, I, I, the term I use is that they're heavy feeders. Um, start fertilizing them in, in around April or May and uh, through like the August, September, like during the, during the bloom months of the year, fertilize them at least once a month and a fertilizer uh, that is higher in phosphorus, which will be your, your what we call a middle number. Uh, if, you, if you look at um, a product, either you know, a water soluble or granular, it'll have typically uh, three numbers, three main numbers on the package. And they, they stand for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So um, this middle number, is what you want a little bit higher than the others. For example, um, 6126 um, on, on, a, on a package. Um, trace elements of magnesium and iron are good. Uh, a regular feeding schedule, you know, um, you can use either slow release granular or water soluble, just whichever is your preference. Um, and I go back to the fertilizer here. The, some people ask me here about uh, Epsom salt. Epsom salt is uh, magnesium sulfate and it is perfectly fine to use Epsom salt. Um, I'll use it 
two or three times a year. And it's, I, I mix up um, a tablespoon and a gallon of water. And Epsom salt's fine even for other, other plants. It's, it's good. Some packages of Epsom salt will even have directions on them how to use it on your, on your plants. So, um, and like here, because it said, you know, magnesium is, is good. Most plants really uh, uh, enjoy that, that extra boost of the magnesium. So. Okay, and then uh, a little bit about mulch. Um, if you've got them planted in the yard, it's just for, for not only plumeria, but other, other shrubs and trees, uh, mulching is, is uh, important. It helps with the weeds and with the soil temperature, we can get pretty hot here in the summers, uh, helps build up organic matter and it just looks good. And there's an example. This is actually taken before Ike, before Hurricane Ike. And this is, this is my house and this is my yard. And I put this in as an example. Here is a raised bed so that the plumeria have better drainage and uh, and I try to keep it mulched. And uh, since Ike, I have not quite gotten back to the back to this um, size or number of plants because we've had other natural uh, weather events. You know, it seems like just when I just when I get my yard close, then then we we either have another storm or or a freeze. And a freeze will will kill your plumeria. So, and I'll get into that a little bit later here. Okay, fragrance. Um, these are some products and, and, and they're all, uh, we'll say either plumeria or frangipani fragrance. So that's, you know, um, it's just one of the, uh, I guess one of the uh, pleasant things about these blooms is, is, I mean, they're beautiful to look at, but the fragrance is just, just amazing. Um, and just, just as you have different colors and different shapes, each one will have a unique fragrance. So, you know, they, they don't all smell just alike. There, there'll be unique fragrance per, per whatever variety it is. And so these are some of the, um, what we would describe it, like, like peach, the, the Aztec gold smells to me just like you sliced a fresh peach. Um, uh, lavender or lemon uh, fragrance, uh, vanilla, rose, you know, this it's just amazing. And, and to me, it's, it's, it's nice to go from one to the next and, and uh, experience the, the uh, different fragrances. Here we go with the Aztec gold. And that's the one I was mentioning that smelled like fresh peaches. Uh, Veracruz rose. This one smells just like what we would think of as a, as a rose fragrance. It's, it's uh, kind of fun because you see Maria, but when you, when you smell it, it's like, wow, that smells just like a rose. This one is called Grape It. Uh, it's it's uh, a beautiful color. Uh, and the fragrance reminds you of those like uh, uh, the grape knee-high drinks. And so that's, that's why it has that name, Grape It. Uh, this one smells uh, kind of like coconut or, or uh, reminds me of certain suntan lotions that have that coconut fragrance. A uh, little bit on pests and diseases. They are they are very hardy plants. They they usually don't have a lot of uh, issues with uh, insects or disease. Um, they may we may occasionally see mealybugs, aphids, or spider mites. And some of these just just taking a, a hose, a water hose, and blasting the leaves, or a little bit of just uh, soapy water, will take care of the issues. Um, some growers use use just liquid dishwashing soap, mix it in with some water, but 
whatever you use, whether it's soap or an insecticide, just remember that, that when you're trying to get rid of the, uh, the not so friendly insects that you can also do harm to beneficial insects. So um, before you reach for something that's, that's detrimental, uh, you know, stop and think, you know, what, what am I doing here? And um, this is an example of what we would consider a beneficial. There's this lady beetle right here. And you can tell this plant may not be 100%, uh, you know, but, but it's still gonna have blooms and the plant's not gonna die, but there's some insects on it somewhere, but then here come your beneficial insects. So sometimes if you sort of let nature do its thing, I mean, I mean, like you, you can just cut a leaf off somewhere if the leaf shows signs of, of uh, insects or, or um, some kind of disease, sometimes just cutting it off, throwing it away. Um, there's uh, on the Galveston County Master Gardener website, um, which I have here, but they they have wonderful information on beneficial insects. Uh, there's a section on there, and it has photos. So that sometimes you'll see an insect, and it's like, oh, but you know, is this a beneficial or not? But this is a good reference. You can look it up. And uh, this is a beneficial that will. It's a type of lady beetle, but it eats mealybugs. Um, This is a picture of it in my yard. This is the beneficial now, but most people, if they saw this, they would want to smoosh it or something. But I, I put this in the program because I want you to see that um, sometimes even though, you know, our first, our first inclination might be, oh, let's get rid of that. But, but here again, if you leave these alone and do a little uh, research, you know, nature's in there trying to do its thing. And this is, this is a beneficial. This, this is, happens to be on a hibiscus. But, but these, these uh, mealybug eaters are out there and it looks like a giant mealybug, but it does that uh, to disguise itself so it can sneak up on the, on the mealybugs and chow down. So. Okay, we're, before I start on uh, propagation, um, are there are there any questions? Okay, okay, we'll keep moving along here. Okay, the two main ways to propagate are from cuttings and seeds. Okay, and if you want an exact duplicate of, of a tree, you want to cut it, take a branch or a piece of that tree. Okay, so if I have an Aztec gold and I want to propagate that, I take a cutting, I cut a piece of that and I will plant it and I'll have an exact duplicate of that tree. Um, you can use a knife, pruners, and, and it's best to take a, a cutting that's at least 12 inches long. Uh, even larger is fine. Larger ones will root. Um, during this past winter when we had freezes and snow, um, I took a lot of really large cuttings, large pieces from the trees that were in my yard and, and I'm beginning to root those now. So I'm just saying like a minimum 12 inches, but larger is all right. Um, typically when you're cutting it uh, this time of year, uh, like April, May through the summer, you will have that latex, that milky latex dripping from it. And some people will uh, dip that into rooting hormone right then. Um, and it helps stop the, or slow down the, the milky sap from dripping and getting all over. Um, then you wanna remove most of the leaves and, and just be nice to your, to your plant and your cutting and use pruners or scissors rather than ripping them off. So if you if you just pull them off, then then you're going to have more of that sap to deal with. 
and it leaves a little bit of a like a, a gap or a hole. So if you and I'll, I have a photo coming up, if you trim them, um, then then they'll heal up a little bit better. But if you the point is is to remove most of the leaves from a cutting from that branch so that the energy will go into forming roots. If you leave a lot of leaves on it, it, it will still root, but it'll take longer because it's it's trying to hang on to those leaves as well as roots. If you remove those leaves, that'll that'll give it a jump start to start rooting. Okay, and here's a picture. Uh, this is just an example. It's like here's a lot of leaves up here and coming in with the, these are just some clippers here. Uh, here's the cut in that, and it has been dipped in a rooting powder, rooting hormone. And that that is optional. Uh, I say it does help, but it, but it'll still root. You know, if you don't have any, that's okay. It'll still root. But I think that the rooting powder does does expedite it somewhat and helps it. Here's uh, what I was talking about, the trimming the leaves. If you take some clippers or scissors and trim rather than jerking and pulling them off, you know, you're, you're gonna leave this little piece here, but in, in a few days, this will dry up and fall off. Um, and, and that way it's healed. It doesn't leave, you know, these wounds that are dripping a bunch of milky sap. Okay, <laughs> it's like, ask me how I know. This is so important. Get your Sharpie and label it. I don't know if you can see this or how well, but I have this written directly on, on this cutting, on this stick here. I put white and yellow. This is the, the flower from this one. It's white with a yellow center, but I wrote it directly on here as soon as I cut it. Because I've learned if I take two or three cuttings, set them down somewhere, and if I haven't written, you know, uh, the ID on there, it's easy to get them mixed up. It's easy, or for me anyway, you know, senior moment uh, to forget, like, which one did I, did I take this cutting off of? So I've learned the hard way just to take a Sharpie and go ahead and write it on there as soon as I cut it. Um, also... If you'll notice, this says industrial right here. If you can find these uh, industrial Sharpies, um, hold up a lot better. They don't uh, fade nearly as quickly, okay? Okay, you want to allow the cutting to dry and callous for a few days. Um, then you place it in a pot. Of, and you know, they're not picky about their soil, just any kind of a, of a good, potting uh, soil, potting mix, that's going to drain easily. Um, if, if they're overwatered or left really wet, they'll rot, they'll get mushy and rot. So, so you want something that drains well. Uh, you want to place the pot on a warm surface, such as a concrete patio. That warmth from the concrete helps with the rooting process. Uh, commercial growers put them on heat mats for that reason, to help you know with the rooting process. Um, you do not water it, like intentionally water it, until you see new leaves forming. Um, there are no roots to absorb. And it's just going to rot if you keep if you keep watering it. Um, a lot of times, I'll I'll water it in one time, like when I'm putting it in the pot, I'll give it one drink, mainly to get that soil um, packed in around, around the stick, around the cutting that helps, helps keep it uh, straight in the pot. And, uh, and then that's it. I won't water it again until I see new leaves. That can be one month or two months, but it's simple, it's simple. You know, it's just got to, you've got to remember to leave it alone, okay? And here's, here's a picture. Uh, here's a pot. Uh, I typically don't use more than a one gallon pot because uh, you, you know, you've got your, your stick, you're cutting here. Put it in, pack, pack this in good and tight there. And uh, sorry, I flipped to this. I'll get to that in a minute about the bag reading. 
Um, but anyway, you leave, you leave it like that for a month or two until you see the new leaves coming out the top. That's your signal to, to uh, start watering it and that it's starting to root. Okay, this is another technique that some people use, and I used to get questions about this. It's called bag rooting. Um, it, and I did it just to kind of try it, see how, how this works. And, and these are just uh, Ziploc bags that, that you cut the zipper part off, put a little soil in it, um, put the stick in that, but, the, but you got to keep it tight like with either, uh, this is painter's tape or electrical tape and, and get it good and tight around that stick. And same thing, you know, just leave it. I usually, I would put these in empty pots so that they would stand upright like this, okay? And then, uh, but the, the advantage to this is that you can actually see the roots. So you know, okay, it's got roots. Then, then you transplant this, you take it out of that plastic and put it in a pot of soil. Um, gotta be careful, um, I learned that the roots tend to stick to the plastic when you're trying to open it up, get it out. So what I would do was I would open it and, and put some water in that, let it sit for a little bit and then very gently get it out of that bag so the roots don't rip and uh, stay. You know, it's like you got all that work, you don't wanna rip those roots off. Okay, uh, here's another example. This is just a clear uh, drinking cup that I've drilled some holes in for drainage. It's kind of the same principle as the, as the bags, but this you want drain holes in it because this part's open up here so that like if it happens to rain, you know, the water can, can drain out. Um, but the advantage to that is that is you can see the roots. Um, when, when I have a lot of roots in, in this cup, then I will transfer it to a little bit bigger pot uh, I, I have used this method quite a bit, actually, because then then it takes the guesswork out. You know, you know, you know the roots are there. This and it drains, um, so that's that's helpful. And and you, you know, some people have used uh, empty uh, plastic clear water bottles. You know, you can you know gardeners kind of <laughs> you know we. Uh, tend to use, you know, you see something and we get resourceful and try it. Um, this is also, if, if you can find these or if you can find something similar, these are aluminum tags and you imprint on here. You just use a pen or a pencil and you imprint the name and, and uh, these are great for labeling all, you know, all kinds of plants. Um, I, they come with, with a little bit of a wire here. It's just sort of thin. So sometimes I'll, I'll substitute that with a little bit thicker aluminum wire. Um, and for a while you could, you could find these. Um, and then in, you know, in recent months it have been a little bit harder to find perhaps uh, online, you know, you could try to order, look it up, but, but these tags are great for tagging labeling. And uh, please remember to clean, like any anytime you've used your scissors, your clippers, or your tools. But this is a kind of a shortcut, but it's, it's very effective. I use uh, rubbing alcohol, and, and this is just an empty squirt bottle. And I do label it. I take my painter's tape and write on here that this is rubbing alcohol. Um, but use that squirt bottle, and you can squirt you're your, like, take that and just squirt your tools, set them down, let that evaporate. And that, you know, then you're not having to get a cloth and open up your bottle and, you know, dip it and rub everything. Just, just give it a good squirt on both sides and it'll evaporate and that's, that'll take care of it. So that's, that's, it's important because you don't want to be uh, inadvertently, you know, transferring something from one plant to another. Okay, well, I'm gonna stop here and see if there's any questions. Okay, so the first question, when cutting for propagation, do you cut at a slant or does it matter? Good question. Um, years ago, 
we were always we were always told to cut at a slant, cut at an angle. And then what they found out was that the the roots on the, on the cutting part, the roots would would only come out at that at that very angle part. And if you cut it straight across, roots will come out all around. If I'm making sense there, rather than that little pointed angle part, it, it gave more surface area for the roots to form. So sometimes what I'll do is initially cut at a slant so that the parent tree that's still out in the elements has a little bit of a slant uh, so that so that rain uh, you know can can uh, run off of it rather than puddle, puddle in it. So I'll cut it at a slant and then I'll go back to my, my cut piece and cut that straight across to give that a little bit more surface area for the, for the roots to form. Um, it, it will root, but, it, but when you've seen that, you know, you're, in my mind, I'm like, oh, you know, it just makes sense to, for the cutting part to be, to be at a flat. Like I say, it's kind of, it's kind of a preference, but it is, uh, you know, I mean, it's, you, you get the same results, but that's the reason, that's the reason why you do one or the other. Okay, so for the tree, parent tree, the slant is what you want correct for the cutting straight straight across. across all right okay the next question what kind of potting soil do you use i i get um any, any kind of a uh potting soil that does not retain moisture um any, any potting mix they're really not picky but but the primary thing is so that it drains well and sometimes I will add uh, perlite. But you can get a little bag of perlite. It's like, it's really light and fluffy. And it's like these little white, it's white little ball looking. <laughs> I'm not sure the material perlite is, but, uh, but you can mix in a little extra perlite with, with any commercial uh, potting mix that aids in, in the drainage. So, um, so, Really, whatever. If you have a preference, if you have a potting mix that that you prefer, then go for it. Okay. And the next one we have is: When do you prune? I have a container plant. Um, you can prune theoretically. You could prune almost any time of year, but if you can do it, uh, April, May, June, kind of the kind of the the spring to early summer is is an optimal time to prune. Uh, the reason being you're cutting your stick will root quicker and the parent tree will uh, have new growth coming out quicker because we're at that time of year when they are kicking in, so to speak, you know they, they are ready to start to start growing, to start making their leaves. Um, now, sometimes for winter storage, uh, we, we prune for several reasons, you know, like either, either your, your plant's big, it's hard to get it inside, then you can definitely prune it then and just, just wait until spring to try to root the, the cuttings. The cuttings will, will, will winter over just fine. Um, but the optimal time, if you have, if you have the choice, would be uh, late spring, early summer. Okay, and then the next question we have, uh, to clarify, are you using the baggie when you're doing the bag rooting? Uh -huh. uh, are you doing that only on the cut area or the whole branch? How, how oh, high are oh you just, just a couple of inches on the cut area. Like just get a small, uh, like a quart Ziploc bag, really small, um, just a handful of soil and tighten it up really, uh, you know, tape it really good, but you're only got um, just maybe a couple of inches of the, of the cut, the raw cut end is, is in that soil. Um, and like I say, I, I primarily did it because I was getting questions about it. Um, I, I prefer to either root in, in a pot or in, a, in one of those clear uh, cups or food storage containers. That's just my preference. But, but, those, but the bag rooting does, does work. And, and like I say, you can see it. 
the, the disadvantage to that is, is when you go, when you open it and you try to take it out to put it in a pot, you, you got to be so careful because those roots tend to, uh, to stick to the, to the plastic. So, so get that, get that really damp before, before you put it, put it in the pot, but only just a small, uh, uh, the end of the cut end goes into the, into the Ziploc. Okay. And that's it for questions right now. Okay, great. Okay. Um, this is a photo of a seed pod. And and sometimes I'll get comments. People say, there's this thing on my primary, it looks kind of like a cigar. And I'll say, great, wonderful. You have a seed pod um, and you will get seeds. This is our other way of uh, propagating primaria. Uh, they'll first appear in the fall and they will, I have a photo here, they'll be on the inflorescence right here. This is where your blooms were all summer, okay? And then if, if the bloom gets pollinated, then you're gonna end up, this is just the beginning of a, of a seed pod. Here's a little bigger, here's a little bigger, go back one. Uh, they form as a result of pollination and they will hang on to that tree for nine months, nine months. Um, Nature times this so that, so that, you know, they get pollinated, they start chewing up in the fall, nine months later, the pods will mature and split open. But, but if you cut it out before that, typically your seeds will not be viable. Okay, so here, here are your seed pods. <clears throat> um, and this is an idea you can use a, a knee-high pantyhose, a knee-high, you know, <laughs> I would say knee-high penny, you know, those knee-high ladies, knee-high hose uh, to cover the pod, but you don't want to do this until spring, like don't do it right away, but if you think that it's getting close to popping open, you can do that or, or any kind of a little uh, net of some sort. Um, but, but when you first see them here, you don't have to cover it. You, you know, you wait till the spring. Um, here, here is what the seeds look like once your pod splits open. And I, I want to um, mention that, that when, when you plant something from a seed, it will not be a duplicate of the parent tree. So if I have a seed pod on an Aztec gold and I plant those seeds I cannot call that Aztec gold because you don't know what pollinated, what, you know, what other flower. So commercial growers plant hundreds and hundreds of seeds every year because this is how you get new varieties. This is how you get something that's totally different from, from you know, what's out there now. And this is what commercial growers strive for. This is what's so exciting about growing them from seeds is because you're going to get something really different. Um, after Hurricane Ike, I began growing a lot from seeds because you see how many seeds are in one pod and each one of these is a, is a plumeria. And, and I thought, wow, that's what a cool way to increase numbers, you know, to get, to get, uh, my inventory back, so to speak. So I started planting seeds and, and it's very rewarding. Um, they have a papery wing. So, so when they, you know, you just very gently pull them out. And here again, this, this is the time of year, like April, May, June, when they will actually ripen and, and open up. Okay. And great time of year to start planting these. Um, it's up to you, personal preference, if you want to plant several of them together in one pot, or you can plant them individually into a smaller pot like this. And I have tried so many different ways. Um, some people will say, oh, you know, you have to point it a certain way into the, into the soil. And, and I, I kind of go back to what nature does. In nature, that, that pod splits open and the wind just picks up the, that's why they have that, 
they're paper light. They're, they're that feathery wing on there, so to speak. The wind just blows them off and then they land somewhere. They just land. And these guys, you know, these seeds are smart. They know which end goes up and which, you know, so just, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to lay them flat. Just lay them flat, just like they would in nature. And I've had better results this way. Now, a lot of people have techniques, uh, how they how they grow from seeds. And if that works for you, go for it. You know, I, I'm, I've throwing out some information that these, this is what works for me. But if you have a method that works for you, you know, by all means, keep, keep doing it. So, and I cover it with just enough potting soil to keep them from blowing away. Like they don't need to be buried really deep. Back to the theory of the wind picks it up, it lands somewhere and then it starts forming roots. Okay, so just enough soil where I live, it gets really windy. So if I don't cover them up, they'll blow out of that pot. Okay, and then on your seeds, be sure and keep them watered. Um, Seeds need moisture to germinate. You know, April showers bring May flowers. Uh, there's a reason for that. So, so this is where it's different. Like when you're when you're propagating from a cutting, you don't want to water it. When you've got seeds, they need moisture. So, um, and since they're not buried very deep, you know, I check them frequently. And and if it's dried out, I I water them. Um, you, you know, you don't want to keep them super wet because then they then they will rot. But you want to keep them moist. Okay, so keep those wet. And here, here's they're not going to be exact duplicates of the parent humaria, so you can't name it that way. But hey, it's your seedling. You can name it what you want. That's the cool part. Okay, and. You get a whole new variety. You get something that's so different. That's that's exciting. Typically within two weeks, this is what you're going to see. Now th this is a pot that had several seeds in one pot, and this you, it's just so so exciting. I think you, know, you see these popping up, <clears throat> and then this is so so when when they get what I call like uh, two sets of of true leaves. Um, so they have four to four true leaves on them, then I will separate them, gently separate them and put them in their own in their own pots. So this is just an example that's just showing you. And then you now here you start to see the resemblance a little bit of, of an actual Maria right here. So you just keep keep putting them in larger pots, larger pots as they grow. Um, a frequent question I get is how, how long does it take before a seedling will bloom? Uh, in our climate here in the Gulf Coast, usually two to five years. Um, the soonest I've ever had one was a year and a half. And then I have had some, if I keep one that hadn't bloomed in five years, I usually give it to somebody, <laughs> give it away. But I figure, hey, it's gonna bloom sometime. Um, typically, though, I would say two to three years before you'll start getting getting blooms. And here's a, here's an interesting uh, point: is that different blooms can originate from the same seed pod. So all those seeds that are in that pod, each one of those can be different. Okay, here's the analogy: it's like a litter of kittens. Most kittens don't look like their mommy and most don't look like their brother or sister, okay? They'll have, they'll be a little different. That's what happens in nature, you know, because, uh, because that flower got pollinated by different insects, things, and then in that, that one pod, you can, but that's so exciting because you can, out of all those seeds, you can get something different. It's pretty amazing. Um, once they bloom and you and you see what they look like, you know, you we we say that's a keeper. In other words, you look at that and it's so spectacular, it's so different. You you want to keep that. And then if there's something that's that's uh, real um, 
I'd say a little more common or something you have similar like that, uh, you know, people can use those as for rootstock. Some people want to graft and they grow seeds specifically to get rootstock. Because when you think about it, the roots are what forms first on a seedling. So it's got the strength um, of that root system. Where, you know, when you take a cutting, that you've got that stick first and then it forms roots. With the seed, the roots, it's got that, that foundation. So a lot of uh, commercial growers might grow, you know, for root stock. They grow, they plant a lot of seeds and then, and then they'll, they'll use some of those for root stock for, for grafting. Oh, all right, these are some examples of, of seedlings that, um, I, you know, I say Groman Galveston County because these were in my yard, but you see the difference, you know, you see how totally different these are and how I think they're just beautiful, how wonderful they are. And this is um, just, just to share what can happen, what you can get. You see how like these petals are so round and then these petals are narrow. You know, this is just, just a, a good variety. And, and the fragrance is unique to each one also. And here's just some more, these are seedlings. These are all seedlings. And, and like I say, you're, a lot of commercial growers plant seeds because you can get things that are different. Okay, um, dormancy begins in late fall. Uh, primarily because our daylight is shorter. Uh, you know, these plants even go dormant in tropical climates uh, where it never freezes. So it's, it's it, uh, nature triggers it to go dormant. That, that's their resting time. Um, as the days get shorter, they'll start dropping their leaves. <clears throat> it just coincides with cooler temperatures. And also, you know, in our, uh, area uh, of Texas, sometimes we have mild winters, uh, you know, and sometimes we, we get, you know, really, really harsh winters, but, uh, but for the most part, they'll start going dormant when, as, as the daylight gets shorter. Uh, they rest for a while, uh, the leaves will drop, and then they do not require water. That's what, that makes them easier to store. Uh, they don't need sunlight or water. Um, they will need protection from a freeze. Freeze will kill them. Uh, if possible, you can move them indoors, keep them above freezing, and you can what we call bare root, which means that you, you shake most of the soil off the roots. Uh, they're dug out of the ground. Uh, but you, you don't want those roots to touch a cold floor or concrete. In other words, put cardboard, newspaper, blankets, uh, uh, something under it so that if you, if you have what we call the bare roots, you don't want those touching a cold surface because that will cause damage. Sometimes the tips, if you lay them up against the side of a garage wall or something, uh, can get damaged if they get too cold. Okay, here is my living room. I, I do not have a garage and I do not have a greenhouse. My option is my living room. So I don't know if you can see, this is plastic, that thick plastic on, a, on the carpet, on the floor. This is a little bit of the television. My husband can still watch his, his uh, black and white Western cowboy shows. Um, and here are my plumeria that stay inside the house for the winter. Uh, you know, some of them may still have leaves on them, but I can, you know, they don't need to be watered. They don't, you know, they're dormant. They're, they're, uh, they're sleeping, so to speak. So I just stack them up, shove them in, in my living room. Uh, and over here, I don't know if you can see there's, uh, there's some cuttings in this in this empty pot there's some cuttings that I had taken this was this was a few years ago that I took this photo but this gives you an idea of uh, of an option things that you can do to store these for the winter uh, you can have if you're fortunate enough to have a greenhouse a garage living room a laundry room 
and you can take large cuttings if your pomeria are too big to move. Take those cuttings and put them indoors for the, for the winter. Um, sometimes you can use freeze cloth or Christmas lights if you've got the large trees that are still on the ground. Um, and you can use a dolly, like one of those utility dollies if you have a large pot, like some of my larger pots, I'll, I'll move and put them up closer to the house. Um, these are just these are just some suggestions and ideas. You know, most winters you get away with it. This past winter was was unprecedented. You know, here's another uh, picture of just, you know just pots just stacked up, just stacked up. And then you can do that because they don't they don't need any uh, care during the winter. You just just find a, a place that won't freeze. Um, if you have them in pots, like here's an example of these, or the pomeria are actually in planted in this pot, and this is a, a bed, flower bed with mulch. But you see, here's one, here's one. Um, so in the winter time, I just go around and take a shovel on the outside, and because because it, they've been in here for several months, the roots will grow out of those drain holes. But it's okay to to cut the roots, you know, cut some of those roots off in the winter when you're bringing this in. So I just take a shovel, dig this out a little bit, and just pull the whole pot and everything. Just pull it up and bring that in. That's an option. Okay. Okay. Um, a little bit about uh, Maria around the world. They are they are considered sacred trees in some cultures. And here again, I touched on this earlier. They're, they're, they're planted in cemeteries or temples or churchyards. And it's because of that yearly cycle of dormancy and then the new growth and the beautiful blooms. Um, and they represent life after death. Okay? Um, these, are, I'm just showing more photos of, of different varieties here. And here again, these were some of these I still have. Some of them, I, you know, the hurricane or the freeze took them. But uh, but it's nice to. I call it eye candy. It's just nice to look at some of these some of these blooms and see the different shapes and colors. Okay, um, in Hawaii, uh, often you'll see uh, people wearing the lays, and plumeria is a very popular flower to use for those. It's um, presented at special occasions as a greeting, uh, symbolic for welcome and friendship, and it, they're very easy to make. I usually use dental floss because it's wax and it can go, and then you can use uh, uh, it, really, any needle, um, they, you can get uh, lay, lay needles that are pretty long, as long as the, the eye of the needle is long enough to get your dental floss through. You know, it's, um, and typically, 50 blooms to, to make a really nice lay. Okay, but, but, but they're gorgeous, and then they just smell like all day long you wear it, and just, it's just such a pleasure to, to have that fragrance there. All right, this is in Hawaii. Um, <clears throat> this is in uh, Cocoa Crater Botanical Gardens. It's free to the public. If you're ever on the island of Oahu, uh, try to make it there. And here's an example. My husband is six foot four. There's his hat. He's standing right here. And here, this back here is one tree right there. 
that in Hawaii or in a temperate climate, the trees can get really large and the fragrance is amazing. You see all those blooms. And then look at all the blooms here on the ground. This is just, it's incredible. So, uh, you know, a little piece of heaven right there. And this, he didn't know I was taking this picture, but I did it here again. I, I, I wanted a person in the picture so you could get the proportion of the size of these trees. See how big these trees are. And this is a, a Hilo Beauty, which is a, a really beautiful dark red bloom, but you see how, how tall this tree is. And look at the size of the trunk, the trunk of this tree. And here's my husband standing next to it. And that's in Hawaii. And I like this photo because of the, I mean, this is a dirt road, you know, <laughs> it just gives you an idea how big these trees get. And look, it's just a, almost like a carpet of, of blooms on, on the ground here. Just amazing. This is a fun book if you're interested in making a lay. And it's it's about uh, Samaria as well as uh, other flowers that you can use to make to make lays. And uh, then these are a couple of references. I, I they, these might be out of print now, but it's a couple of uh, uh, good reference for Pomeria. And the Pomeria Society of America was founded in Houston, Texas. Um, and it's a nonprofit, it's volunteers, and we share information about Pomeria. And they have a website. Um, you can go there and, uh, you know, perhaps get more information. And thank you all for your patience. It's my first time to do a, a a Zoom <laughs> presentation. So appreciate your patience with me. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us today. We appreciate having you here and hope to see you at our future programs.